Hello, we are back with the second part of this week's comic book reviews, uh, week of January 20th, 2016. First video, we did a lot of Marvel stuff and uh, the spirit, and in this video, we're covering a whole bunch of DC stuff, but before we get to that, I want to talk about Clean Room issue number four. And the first thing I want to talk about this issue is the cover. It is amazing. I think this cover really encapsulates everything about the series so far because it perfectly kind of marries uh, the series kind of horror with all the hands coming up and grabbing at her uh, at everything but also it's kind of sensuality it's kind of an erotic cover um, a lot of hands positioned around the crotch the skin tight outfit the pink um, and it, that's kind of what this series is about so far it has this kind of erotic horror, this uh, horror, sexual horror sort of thing going on. Um, and so I think this is just a great fucking cover um, to this book. We begin this book with something that doesn't really pay off um, yet. I'm sure it'll pay off in the future, but uh, kind of a non sequitur um, as Astrid, as 15 years ago rather, this is part of a flashback, 15 years ago, Astrid and her associates um, which seems to be the beginning of her cult, go up to find this Dr. Hagen in Norway, or Hagen, I think, in Norway, where Astrid asks Dr. Hagen to build her a cloudbuster. And we have no idea what a cloudbuster is, but um, that is what she is asking him to build, and in exchange she offers, um, I mean, again, I can't show it, but she offers, like, room and board, and also... Um, because the doctor has a bit of a sex addiction thing, offers some, like, live porn. She offers her uh, associates as kind of a porn sort of thing going on. Not, not as prostitutes, but that he will be able to look at them naked for as long as he wants every day or something like that. Flashing back to the present, we have um, Killian and um, another of Astrid's um, people named, um, Capone, um, we have, uh, Killian and Capone having to deal with the fallout of a celebrity suicide. The celebrity was part of Astrid's cult or whatever. He committed suicide. The media wants to blame Astrid. And so Killian calls Chloe, who is a, a journalist, and asks Chloe to see if Chloe can write them some good PR in order to get them out of this. Meanwhile, um, Chloe is headed back home, um, and she we have this really sweet scene between Chloe and her neighbors, and Chloe's neighbors are saints. Um, they're just really nice, kind of aw shucks, good old boy guys. Um, like, very kind of American heartland, just good. They're like the Kents. These are like a, a neighborhood full of Kents and all the neighbors who tried to stop that weird goblin thing that broke into Chloe's home uh, last issue or a couple issues ago. Um, tell her, oh, they had a break in and we tried to stop him, but he beat us up and don't worry, we'll get him next time. And, and it's just so, it's like sweet. Like these, these guys really are kind of like, aside from beating people up, they're kind of saints. Like they really looking out for Chloe and Chloe says if Astrid touches them, then like Chloe's out for blood, which is totally understandable. And the rest of this issue is also, I don't know how much of it I can show, um, but we have Astrid dealing with the thing from last issue, the thing that ran her over when she was a child. And um, it's kind of invading this guy, it's possessing this poor guy, and Astrid is trying to have a discussion with it, um, and things just get freakier and freakier from there on. Um, as Astrid tries to deal with it, it flips its face around um, and starts going after Astrid um, and like wants to sexually attack her. Uh, it says, I've always found you attractive, a kiss before dying, well you've kissed the man you've killed, um, sort of thing. So it's like this weird Again, like, like kind of sexual horror thing that this book has going for it. Also, while that's happening, Chloe does return home. And in her home, she finds that there's still something there with her. 
or something has taken all the knives out of her drawer and rearranged them in the bathtub and wants her to hurt herself. Um, and then we find at, at the end what that thing below, you know, in her home with her is, and it is, it is spooky. Um, it's not a completely new thing, but we get more information on things that we have seen before in this series. So this book just continues to be amazing. Um, it really, it, it is just everything it's supposed to be. It's erotic, it's horror, it's scary, it's creepy, um, it's this weird, off-putting, sexy, um, like not sexy as in like, ooh, sexy as in it is about sex. It relates back to sex, um, but in a, again, in a very creepy, off-putting way, um, which like, it's, it's really effective. This is a an effectively scary book, um, and if you want horror, then this is a really good horror book to get on, um, so I recommend it. Next up, also from Gail Simone, is Secret Six, the finale of this current arc right here. Um, and to be honest, it's kind of an anticlimax. It's a diegetic anticlimax, it's an anticlimax that is explained in the story. That's why it's an anticlimax, but it is still an anticlimax. Um, because we begin with some good stuff. We begin with one of the Elder Gods awakening, um, one of the Elder Gods that has been threatened from the first issue of this arc, finally awake and on Earth and threatening to kill everything. Then we flash over to Metropolis as uh, Zatanna recruits Superman in order to stop the Secret Six from breaking the last two columns and releasing the Elder Gods onto the world. Um, all pretty good. Um, really good setup. And so, of course, we have then the, um, the Secret Six going out to destroy the last two columns, which are conveniently in the same place. And we have the mages uh, still fading out of existence as the magic drains from the world and gets eaten. And while all of this is happening, we also have uh, Black Alice, who, knowing everything that she has done and everything that she is kind of destined to do, asks uh, Scandal to just end it, asks Scandal to help her commit suicide to prevent the end of the world. Um, and so that's everything we have going into this book. Eventually we do have um, the Secret Six versus Superman, which is a pretty exciting battle that actually is more even than you might expect, considering Superman is on one side. Um, we have the mages gearing up to finally go to war, take the battle to the Secret Six, and we have whether or not Black Alice is successful in committing suicide. Um, we find out more about Black Alice, we find out the lengths that the Secret Six are willing to go to in order to protect their friend, which is really cool. Um, and we find out, yeah, we find out a lot more about Black Alice, something that going forward has a big effect on the six on the rest of the story and the secret six um but like i said this ending is an anticlimax it is an issue that by the end everything is resolved um but it doesn't we never face the big threat head on it is kind of skirted um and i don't want to spoil how um but it is an anticlimax we don't actually we don't ever get Secret Six and Superman and the Mages versus the Elder Gods. That does not happen by the end of this book. We get something else. We get something um, that should be more devious and disastrous in the future. Um, but because this is the end of this arc, we won't see that again for probably, you know, at least until the arc after the next arc. So that is that. But we do find out a lot, like there is a lot of development for the series going forward, even if this kind of fizzles out on its own story, it's setting up a lot for the stories to come. So if you can appreciate that, then that's what this is. So, and otherwise all the character stuff is still great, it's still funny, the jokes still work, there's still a lot of tension up until that anticlimax. Um, like it, it's tense, you have again, Superman versus the Secret Six and the Mages and, and uh, Alice's suicide and all that, so. And there's still a lot in this book, despite that. 
Next up, we have flipping my notes. We have Martian Manhunter issue number eight, and a lot going on in this issue too. Um, so we have the Manhunter on Mars, and um, we see him drop into one of the Martian cities, and the Martians greet him as a hero. The Martians have told and heard stories of the Martian Manhunter and believe him to be a savior of their race. And so the Manhunter decides that, yes, he is going to be Mars' hero. Um, after that, we catch up with the other parts of the Martian Manhunter. So we catch up with, uh, what is his name? We catch up with uh, Wessel, who is being held prisoner by a all-grown-up Alicia. Um, and it's not just Wessel. Um, Alicia is holding all of the other parts of Martian Manhunter prisoner. So uh, Wessel, Pearl, and, um, and Mr. Biscuits are all being held prisoner by an, a grown-up Alicia. We find out how Alicia got grown up and to Mars, and we find out that she's not the only human on Mars, that um, everybody on the, seven, on the 747 from a couple issues ago also got to Mars, and half of them, or more than half of them, have been killed by um, Malafalaka, the big evil uh, Martian guy who wanted to bring Mars back in the first place. Um, and so Alicia has sworn revenge on Mars, on the Manhunter, and on, Ala on Malaka Laka Laka, which I'm never going to know how to pronounce. As this is happening, um, Malaka Laka Laka is going on attack. So Malaka Laka Laka attacks Mars, and the Martian Manhunter goes after him because he's attacking his own people, um, and the Martian Manhunter is just sworn to protect them. And Alicia goes after him um, because Alicia also wants revenge on Malaka Laka Laka. And that's not his name, but I cannot pronounce his name. His name is... Uh, I wrote it down. M A apostrophe A L E F A apostrophe A K. Malafica. Malafica. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just gonna keep on saying Malafalaka Laka. Um, because I can pronounce Malafalaka Laka. Uh, meanwhile, in a more comedic scene, we see we catch up with Pearl and Mr. Biscuits directly as Mr. Biscuits breaks out of jail, um, finds his reason for fighting to protect Earth, which is that. Earth is where all the cookies are, and Mr. Biscuits loves cookies, um, and goes after this Martian child who seems to be a, uh, an important figure, because all of the, the Manhunter also mentions the Martian child, and he just seems like he knows what's going on for some reason. So we have Mr. Biscuits going after the Martian child, Martian Manhunter versus Malafalaka Laka, and by the end of this book, Alicia and her team also catches up with uh, Malaka Laka Laka and joins in the fight in a very cool, very just awesome, over-the-top way, and I can't wait to see how that turns out next issue, so they have sold me on that. Martian Manhunter, still a very good book, very fun, a little complex at times, lots going on, lots of different characters, some of who are the same characters, but different parts of that character, so, um, but yeah, if you can keep it all together, and this book isn't, like, it's not a complicated read, it doesn't present, it's not intentionally complicated, they're just lost in moving parts, um, but if you care to make it through all that, then totally worth your time, one of the better books that DC is putting out right now. Next up is Wonder Woman, issue number 48, and this is the issue that finally convinced me that I don't have to be reading Wonder Woman right now. Um, it's just not good. Um, it's another one-shot, another one-and-done, not a, doesn't seem to be the start or anything of a new arc, um, but it's not, it's just not good. Um, first of all, it seems that we're back, and like, in the cover and the interior, it's the same thing, it seems that we're back to the old Wonder Woman costume. Uh, like, they made this whole big deal of Wonder Woman's getting a new costume, and it's, you know, covering her up more, and she looks more like a warrior, but it seems that we're just going back to the old one, so, okay. Um, I mean, I like that costume, too, but whatever. Back to the old costume. And this story concerns Wonder Woman going after a Dr. Maru, um, whose motivation makes no sense. 
She is an evil scientist who develops a uh, bioweapon, a uh, poison, um, to use on America because the Soviet Union killed her parents. Like, it, it literally makes no sense. Like, she spells it out here, all of it here. She says that the Americans approached her parents looking for them to make a bioweapon. Her parents refused, and then Soviet Russia, thinking that her parents were working for the Americans, killed her parents. And so now, all grown up, Dr. Maru wants revenge on the Americans. It, that is her motivation. It makes no sense. Um, it's not even like she wants to target the Americans to start a war where the Americans will attack Russia. She just wants the Americans to feel pain because the Soviets killed her parents because they thought they were working for the Americans. It, it's dumb. And that's basically the rest of the story. There are no stakes because she doesn't have a superpower or anything. She is just a scientist. This is what Wonder Woman does to her car in the first, in, on like the fourth page. Um, granted, this is a decoy, but like this is what happened. This is Wonder Woman you're going up against. You need something other than I'm really, sm I mean, I guess with like Superman just being really smart is enough. But Wonder Woman, you know. It's not even about being, like, very smart. It's about being, like, the smartest, and then you have to have, like, a real plan, you know? It can't just be, I'm going to threaten the president with some poison gas, which is her entire plan. Um, like, seriously, that's it. Wonder Woman just lassos this drone thing, and then that's it. She saves the president, and then just has to chase Dr. Maru down. And then the rest of the issue is a, is a chase scene. It is Wonder Woman chasing after Dr. Maru, Dr. Maru... Uses a distraction involving the people of London, which lasts like no page, like half a page pretty much, before it resolves itself, and then one of them goes after Maru, and Maru is just a normal human who poses no threat. It's boring. It looks good. This is a really well done, like drawn book, but there's. Oh, it's nothing. There's nothing here. There's no stakes, and at the very end, they have a ham fisted. Wonder Woman learns a moral about humanity and how evil it is to swear vengeance on things, and then something bad happens to somewhere, someone else, and that's going to be the thing. That it's just not good. Drop Wonder Woman. It's... I don't know why it's so bad. I don't know why DC is not doing more to push Wonder Woman. She's going to be in a movie this year. She's going to be a, you know... She's one of their oldest characters. She's part of the big three. Why have... These crappy Wonder Woman stories. I just don't get it. You have good writers that you could put on Wonder Woman, but it's just not good at all. Luckily, things pick up with Robin, son of Batman, issue number eight. Um, and I just noticed Ray Fox is on this book now. And um, I'm going to have to check if this is Ray Fox's first issue um, on this book or not. But uh, it is a bit of a noticeable change, although we are going back to the old formula. Um, the framing device of this issue, which is another one-shot, another one-and-done, is that Damien is telling Alfred a story while Alfred is giving Damien a haircut, which is adorable. I love all these little reminders that, oh yeah, Damien's like 10 years old and he's still a kid and... Like, even though he's, he's, just, he's just so cute in this scene, he's indignant about getting his hair cut um, by Alfred. And so Alfred asks Damien to tell him a story about the Bloodless Blade, which is a return to the old Year of Blood formula, where we have Robin, uh, Nobody, and Goliath returning an artifact that Damien stole during the Year of Blood. So it's a return to that old formula, but we haven't had it in a couple issues, and it's uh, pretty good. Like, just, it's a pretty good one-shot, all in all, you know, all told. Um, it's enjoyable writing. Um, the big threat inside the temple this time is that, um, of course, the thing was cursed, because these things are all cursed, and the curse this time was that after Robin stole it, uh, the, uh, the guardian of the temple knew that he would be back and cursed Robin that when he returns, he will face double the threat. He will face himself at his worst, and so as soon as Davian and nobody enter the temple, they are confronted by their dark future selves. So you have an older Damien who's Damien al Ghul, never got picked up by Batman, just gave in to his arrogance and his bloodlust, and we have an older nobody who still swears vengeance on Damien and hates her 
younger good self for uh, being friends with Damien, for dropping her grudge. Um, so that's the big fight. They learn to overcome the evil within them and d return the artifact and everything is nice and solved in a big bow tie by the end of the book. Um, again, it's a one and done, but it's and it's a formula we've seen before, but it's good. It's a well-written book. It's a fun little story. Um, it is completely skippable, but if you have the four dollars and you want to read a fun Robin story, then this is it. And we get a cute and dignant Damien getting a haircut, which is which is a boost, which is a nice flavorful little boost to the story. Moving on from Robin, we are finally at Batman issue number 48. It seems like this took longer to come out, maybe just because I am always just so hyped for this book um, that it has felt longer than a month since we got the last one. But we have, um, we're nearing the end of the, uh, of the Super Heavy arc. I think only one or two more issues left. Um, uh, the solicits already, like, we have the solicit where, you know, that comes after this story already, so, um, we know that's happening, and we're finally reaching the end here, and it, it's big. They have escalated this story over and over again. So in the last issue, we ended with, uh, Bruce Wayne on a bench in the park being approached by someone who looked a lot like the Joker, who... If he is anything like Bruce Wayne, has lost his memories of being the Joker. And so these two enemies, these two opposites, arch enemies for 75 something years now, finally, like for the first time, can have a nice, peaceful one on one chat with each other. And that's what they do. Um, they're both similar, you know, in that they were these people and they forgot who they were. They were damaged in the Joker attack. and. Joker doesn't remember who he was, Batman, well, Bruce Wayne remember, like knows he was Batman, but can't remember any of that. And so the two can just have a nice talk to each other. Um, and they discuss finding peace after the accident. Uh, Joker, or, yeah, we don't know what to call him now. We don't actually get his name in this issue either. So he's just the Joker, but he's not the Joker. I'm going to call him the Joker, though. So we have Joker, who, after the accident, after being reborn in a way, was suicidal, um, but learned to, like Bruce, he had no idea what to do with himself, he was suicidal, but then he found his purpose in life, and he started a life for himself, he works in a butcher shop, and he found peace um, and happiness. Um, and him and Bruce discuss the nature of Gotham, and the nature of things that have moments of peace and moments of violence and wondering if there's going to be violence when what's the point of keeping up the peace um and they have a discussion about that about the again like uh as much as i like scott snyder he he is a little ham-fisted with his metaphors um like they're really obvious he's just all of his stories are talking about batman in a way um and so this is again just it's the Joker asking Batman, even though it's not the Joker and Batman, it's Bruce Wayne and whoever the Joker is when he's not the Joker, discussing, well, what's the point? You know, why save this poison place if, you know, why bother cleaning it up if it's just going to fall back into poison and into disarray? Um, which is the question that Joker always asks Batman, you know? Order versus chaos. If things are going to get more and more chaotic, why bother, you know, restoring them to order? While they have this conversation, um, Bloom attacks Gotham. Bloom goes full out assault on Gotham City. He has Gordon in his hand. Gordon cannot escape, and Bloom just wreaks havoc. And we get Bloom's manifesto on Gotham City, which is that Gotham is a garden at war with itself. It's a bunch of people who are never supposed to be together, all in the same place, fighting for dominance, fighting for control, and that its destiny is to tear itself apart. Um, and so he's planted seeds all over the place to give people superpowers so that they can make it on their own and not, you know, just assert their own dominance in Gotham City. So we get 
Bloom's whole manifesto here. We got the Joker talking to Bruce Wayne. And by the end of the book, we have Bruce Wayne spring into action. He decides that, you know, there's still, the lake is still worth cleaning up. Gotham is still worth cleaning up in his own way. It's still worth saving. And he goes to save the kids that he's taking care of. He goes to save Jules. And by the end of the book, he uh, decides how far he wants to go into saving Gotham City or not. And we have the cops bring out all of their weapons to go up against Mr. Bloom as well. Um, so definitely building up to a finale here. Um, and it's just, it's a little on the nose, um, as Scott Snyder tends to be, but it's just, it's well written. It's good. It's climactic. It's full of, like, just tension and action. Um, it's propelling. It's just really good Scott Snyder Batman. It's, you know, what we've been getting for the past four years now, and it's uh, just as good as it ever was. And the last book this week is Batman and Robin Eternal, um, which, again, these books are kind of hard to review as weeklies. I really like the cover, I can say that, but I do not like the art on the inside, or at least half the, not half, a little less than half of this book. The art is atrocious. Um, I'm so, it just, it just is. Um, here's the first page. We have Batman and Robin going to Cairo to attack the Joker. Batman has other plans involving a rendezvous with Mother. Um, but yeah, just just look at this art. Just it's it's not good. I'm sorry. I this art is just bad. Luckily, it's only in those parts of the book. For. The parts not involving Batman and Dick Grayson, we have another artist, um, as we see um, Tim and Azrael uh, go up against Dumas, while uh, Jason, who is infected by the, I have no idea how to pronounce this, Ichthyus virus, um, however you want to pronounce that word, Jason is infected with the Ichthyus virus, which is Mother's new tool for creating her children which um, makes the person face their greatest fear and then overcome it so that they no longer have any fear or emotion whatsoever. And so Jason is dealing with that, and Tim and Azrael are still being held captive by Dumas. Um, so inside Jason's head, we have him defeating the Joker that killed him. Um, which is bad because then he turns into one of Mother's children, essentially. And meanwhile, we have Azrael and Tim versus Dumas. Um, Azrael breaks himself out. He decides to defy, uh, to defy the order of St. Dumas and go against them, teaming up with Tim Drake. And Tim Drake tries to find a way to help cure Jason um, by making a hologram of the brain or whatever. Um, it's not, that's not how it ends. Tim finds another way to help out Jason, luckily. That's a bit more exciting, a bit more, uh, dynamic and cinematic. So, all things good there. And, um, again, it's a weekly. I don't want to spoil how it kind of ends. But, at the middle of this book, we have Batman, who is making a decision about meeting Mother. And we have Tim and Azrael versus the physical forces of the Order of St. Dumas. And Jason, who has to either conquer his death or face it once again. Um, and, yeah. So that's that's that. That is Batman and Robin Eternal. Pretty good issue. Again, the art is my biggest issue um, with this entry. Just, it's ugly. In pl it's very ugly in places. Um, but other than that, the Jason stuff is pretty good. The Tim and Azrael stuff is pretty good. Azrael actually gets some pretty heroic moments, which is cool. Um... And we're left with big questions about Batman, you know, by the end of this. Did he? Did he not? Blah, 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 stuff like that. And so that is this week in comics, or the comics I picked up. Again, uh, if you are interested in the Marvel books I picked up this week, that is in part one of this video, so check that out. Or not, you know, if you're not interested, okay, that's fine. But I do want to thank you for watching this video. Uh, if you did like it, please uh, give it a thumbs up. Uh, any comments, questions, anything whatsoever, 
book recommendations, arguments, whatever you want to do, leave them in the comments and I will try and address them to the best of my ability. Um, please subscribe uh, if you you know feel like watching me every week or whatever. Um, I also do other stuff if you're not into comics so much, but we made it to the end of this video, so I'm guessing you are. And yeah, that is it for this week. Again, thank you for watching, and I hope that you do join me for some more comic book reviews.